Hello, this is Travis Moore uh, coming to you today with part two of a six part series on the Philippines and in particularly the Open Door Island Ministries that I'm about to be a part of in just a few short weeks from when I'm making this recording. Uh, I have long had a great desire in my heart and a burden for missions work in the Philippines. It started when I was a teenager many years ago but has continued down through the years uh, and now I have an opportunity of returning to the Philippines and I guess what some people would say are my sunset years. I'm 72 years old and I don't know how much longer I will be in uh, good enough health to continue to minister and do missionary work but as long as that is I hope to spend the rest of my uh, productive life in the Philippines uh, sharing the good news about Jesus, teaching the Bible, and helping people come to under know, understand and know who Jesus is. I have this burden because there are a lot of people in the Philippines. As I mentioned last time, there are more than 110 million people living in the Philippines. I saw a recent statistic that raised that up to 116 million plus. They speak over 175 different dialects. And of the 7,600 plus islands, more than 2,000 of them are inhabited. Now most of the people live on 20 or 25 of the largest islands in the country, but there are thousands and thousands of people who live in the remote villages and small islands of the country where there is very little or no gospel witness. And those are the people that I have a burden for and a desire to reach. And I want to share with you a little bit uh, today about how, how all of this came about in my life. When my wife and I were 23 years old, we applied to be missionaries for the Baptist Missionary Association of America. I mentioned uh, in the video last time about how all of that came about. But when we were 23 years old, we made our application and were accepted, and we were approved, sent out by our local church, and approved by the association to be the first missionaries of the BMA in the Philippines. Now, to be honest, since we were the first ones going there, we didn't have a lot of uh, information or uh, ideas about what to do. We just knew God had called us to the Philippines, and really the only thing I knew was Manila. And so we were intending to just go to Manila and see what happened. Well, God had a different plan. We were doing what we call our deputation, which was a three-month period of time where we visited churches and shared with them our uh, goals for ministry in the Philippines. We met a couple in the Philippines uh, who uh, told us about their town and the need for the gospel in the town where they lived. It was Mr. and Mrs. Caro. At the time, they were living in Dallas, Texas, and were a member of a church there. But they had been living in Talisay, Negros Occidental. And they said, our town needs a good, soul-winning, Bible-preaching church. Would you consider going to our town? We thought, hey, that's great. That's a wonderful idea. Uh, they even said, we have a house. You can live in our house rent-free. And uh, if you can go there and start a church. And Mrs. Caro even said, you know what? I will go with you. Let me know what your flight schedule is, and I will meet you, and I will fly with you to the Philippines, and uh, I will introduce you to my family and my friends, and show you around and help you get settled uh, while you're there. And so uh, that sounded wonderful to us. Well, the time came for us to go to the Philippines. We booked our flight from New Orleans to the West Coast, to Honolulu, and on to Manila. When we told Mrs. Caro about our plans, she said, that is wonderful. I have a son who lives in Honolulu. I will go and spend a week with him and visit him and my grandkids. And then I will get on the same flight that you are on out of Honolulu, and we will go together to the Philippines. 
That sounded great. We got to Honolulu and no Mrs. Caro. About 15 to 20 minutes before we were to depart Honolulu, Mrs. Caro came running up to our gate and she said, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. My passport has expired and I cannot go tonight. I will follow next week. But don't worry, I've already told Mr. Raphael, a friend of mine, he will meet you at the airport. He will take you to the house. My son Samuel has prepared everything for you. You can move right in and I will see you next week. So, that sounded great. We got to the college city, got off the airplane, looked for Mrs. Ra uh, Mr. Raphael, and we couldn't find anybody named Mr. Raphael. Mr. Raphael was there looking for us, but he was expecting Mrs. Cairo. And he didn't know us, and we didn't know him. So he left the airport, and we were still standing there. They started turning the lights off, and we didn't know what to do. So we finally decided to get a taxi and just, I guess, go to a hotel and figure it out from there. So we got into a taxi, and the taxi driver started out of the airport, and he said, where to, sir? And I said, I don't know. We are supposed to go to Talisi. Talisi? I'm from Talisi, he said. I know where that is, and he started for Talisi. He gets a few miles down the road, and he said, where in Talisi are we going, sir? I said, we don't know. We were supposed to meet Mrs. Caro, and she was going to go with us and take us to her house. Mrs. Caro? Mrs. Caro was my teacher in high school. I know where her house is. And off he went and took us to Mrs. Caro's house. Now, I don't know about you, but I think that was a little bit of divine uh, planning there uh, that really assured us that God was doing something special for us. Two days later, uh, I was able to share the gospel with two different groups of high school students and see more than 60 uh, high school students come to know Jesus uh, in those two meetings, just the first three days that we were in the Philippines. We went into, we moved into Talisa, and Mrs. Caro did show up a week later. She helped us get established, and it wasn't long before we were doing a home Bible study in the house that belonged to Mrs. Caro. A month after we arrived, a new radio station opened in our area, and they offered me a daily radio program in English for $2 for a 15-minute program. And I would go and preach, and they would rebroadcast it at night for free. So that started and opened our open door broadcast. We later uh, had a, a telecast as well. A few months after we were there and got started, we had our first baptismal service, and that's the group who got baptized, the very first baptismal service we had. More than 30 of them, I think about 36 or 38. We started Open Door Baptist Church, started as a home Bible study, we eventually organized into a church, and eventually we bought property and built the building you see there on the screen. But God was doing something special, opening doors of opportunity. Young men were surrendering to preach. Young ladies were committing their lives to serve God. And we needed to train them. And so my brother came to the Philippines a couple of years later in 1976 and started what is now called the BMAP Bible College. And it has gone on down through these years, more than 40 years faithfully teaching and training men and women to serve God. We also started a Christian Academy, Open Door Christian Academy. And that school continues today. And wonderful, wonderful things have happened in that school and uh, wonderful things have happened through the lives of the children who come from that school. Many of them are working in different parts of the world and carrying the gospel of Jesus with them. In 1976, we had our first missions outreach from our church to small islands. We called it the Open Door Island Harvester Ministry. We had a boat similar to the one you see there. We had 20 some odd people on the boat, and we went to eight different tiny islands. 
where there were anywhere from 20 families to a thousand families living on these islands. And we would spend the night and we would share the gospel and spend a day or two if necessary sharing the gospel with people and seeing people come to know Jesus as Savior. That's where I got the real burden for small island ministry. We expanded that in 1979 to a group of islands called the Gigantes Islands. We even started a church on Isla de Gigante. These two folks you see on the screen, Aaron and Annalisa, were just children back then, but their parents were among the first con converts in Isla de Gigante. And they grew up in that little church that we started, and today they are the leaders in that church. So God opened a door for us way back then, and I think he's opening a similar door for us now. And in my next video, I'm going to tell you about that.